ourselves. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Josh Bolick. I'm a scholarly communication librarian at the University of Kansas. Um, Will and Maria, do you want to introduce yourselves as well? Sure. sure. I'm, I'm Maria Bond. Uh, I am a professor at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign School of Information Sciences, and I direct the Masters of Science in Library and Information Science program there. And uh, although I'm based in Champaign, Illinois, I spent part of my life in the Pacific Northwest, which is where I am today. Oh, and I should say that if our conversation is as full as I hope it will be, I'll have to duck out a little early because I have a command performance meeting back at the office, uh, but you're in good hands with Josh and Will. And thank you so much for showing up for this. Thanks, Maria. And I'm Will Cross. I'm the director of the Copyright and Digital Scholarship Center in the North Carolina State University Libraries. So that means I'm a lawyer who's also a librarian. So I'm really fun at parties. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, <laughs> So, um, so yeah, I thank you all for taking the time to be here. Um, and we hope this is a really participatory and informal conversation. I've been encouraged by the other sessions that I've attended this week that were not formal and were pretty comfortable and small enough to actually have a discussion. Um, so no expectations of uh, any kind of, you know, strict formality uh, on our part, for sure, in this. Um, as you see fit, uh, with or without audio, with or without video, um, we'll try to monitor the chat. But obviously, you know, this works best if, if we um, at least use audio for a discussion, um, but your video use is totally up to you. We do want to affirm the community participation guidelines and our intent to host a safe uh, and respectful conversation that affirms the intrinsic value of all participants. and. Um, we already did some uh, kind of participant introduction or kind of where you are in the chat. So I'll skip that part. But we think that this is going to take about an hour and um, as soon as possible, get past the part well, where Will and Maria and I are talking and can turn into uh, more of a discussion. So here's the agenda that we um, sketched out, um, starting with a background on uh, how the scholarly communication notebook fits in our into our broader project. The Scalcom notebook is a face of our, our collaboration, uh, but not the sole face of it. Um, Will's going to introduce the Scalcom notebook, uh, and uh, Maria is going to provide some examples of projects that we recently approved through. Um, we have some funding to provide awards uh, to help build the collection um, that will be contained therein, and then we'll move so that you know this is all framing so that. We have enough background to kind of um, enter into this conversation um, and engage with these questions together. So um, if there are no questions so far, um, our collaboration is born from this mutual real realization that topics of increasing importance are poorly addressed by LIS education. Um, all three of us realized at, at slightly different points, though all roughly in the like early 20 teens um, that scholarly communication, librarianship and issues are ascendant in higher ed in particular, but beyond that as well, um, but that they're not sufficiently addressed with a, a few exceptions by LIS programs. Um, and so there's, a, uh, there's an attendant problem to that, which is that there's a pretty broad gap and the Institute for Museum and Library Services in the US acknowledges this between practitioners and faculty. And so we have people um, who in the library and information studies programs who are teaching our future colleagues, but maybe have never actually practiced, you know, as a, a librarian uh, and or there may be a long time since they have done that. And so we're, our idea and the source of our collaboration was uh, is an open textbook of scholarly communication librarianship um, where we would collaborate as broadly as possible to bring as many voices in as we could uh, in within that format um, to 
represent practitioner perspectives, real on the ground, what the work that we do is and how we do it, and what theory informs it. Um, and then to go to LIS programs and say, we know that you aren't teaching this and we know that there's some legitimate reasons why that might be a struggle, but we as a field have collaborated together to curate that content and give it to you in an open uh, format where it's you know either uh, suited to a topics and scholarly communication kind of course or distributed across the curriculum as it intersects with lots of other areas, which it does. Um, and so that's the um, sort of genesis of our, our project is this open book. Um, that's forthcoming by ACRL, we hope in the coming year. Um, it will have a CC BY and C license. Um, there are over 50 contributors to it. Um, and that's the thing that I will be the most proud of, I think, is uh, the amazing people that have contributed their time uh, and ideas um, to it. I'm really proud of who we've pulled together uh, as both editors as well as, um, as authors. Um, but in having discussions about the book um, and pursuing research that informs it, um, we, and in lots of discussions with colleagues, we realized that a book is necessarily uh, limited. It's static, it's narrow in that even with 50 contributors, 50 does not make the entire field, right? Um, and it's exclusive, like there's still, we selected the people that, um, that are included there and that, that there, there's bias cooked into that because it's unavoidable, right? Um, and so rather than a single resource, we really need a corpus of content that instructors and students and practitioners can utilize to learn about um, scholarly communication topics. And that led us to conceive of what we're calling the scholarly communication notebook, which is a direct nod to Rajiv uh, Jangiani and Robin DeRosa's open pedagogy notebook. And I, I now Will's going to tell you more about that. If I can move the slide forward. Right. Thanks, Josh. So, so exactly as Josh said, we're really excited about the book as a model for creating sort of static textbooky open educational resources. It offers this great bridge between the classroom and the field. Um, it emphasizes through those 50 editors and other ways, the idea that there's no single sort of right way to do SCALCOM, that there are a multiplicity of different approaches to that. Um, and it, we sort of recognize that no static resource can reflect that multiplicity of approaches uh, that makes SCALCOM in particular great, right? It's a field where the fun stuff is, it's about exploring and asking questions and trying new things, not about sort of doing it the right way. Um, so, so we hope the open license is gonna help with that in the context of the book. Um, but we also have been having a lot of conversations about how we model and facilitate that sense of transformation and exploration and decentering a one sort of unified right way to do it, right? Um, so, so said differently, if the book is the OER, what does the open pedagogy piece look like? How do we do the open open pedagogy aspect of this OER plus SCALCOM stuff? Um, and the themes we kept coming back to are very open pedagogy -y themes, right? Centering, decentering individual authors and connecting diverse and exploratory voices and approaches, empowering students to create something that contributes to the commons in some way because that values it differently and it refreshes it in important ways. Um, in short, making it about the people and the process, not just the stuff, right? That's what SCALCOM is about. That's what open pedagogy is about. So how do we connect those things? And our first sort of stab at answering those questions or maybe at least exploring those questions is this thing Josh mentioned, the scholarly communication notebook. Um, we, we reached out to IMLS and got some funding to sort of get it started. Um, and it's so far taken kind of three different uh, aspects. There's sort of three pieces to it. <clears throat> the first is that the SCALCOM notebook is going to be a hub in OER Commons, a place for sharing materials and models. That's sort of where the stuff piece of it lives. Um, and that should be ready in the next few weeks, I think. It's, it's certainly spinning up now. Um, the second is that we're explicitly tying this to uh, open pedagogical practices and assignments. And we've been lucky to have several faculty members at LIS programs agree to incorporate this as a way to sort of do the open pedagogy work and practices in their own classrooms. Um, and Maria is one of those as well. So she can potentially speak to that. But the idea is one of your assignments, maybe your final assignment is 
you know, pull some resources, fork them and, and make them relevant in new contexts or identify gaps and fill them in. So the work of learning about SCALCOM becomes engaging with and participating in this Scala Communications Notebook. So that's the process, that the stuff and the process, right? And then the third is what this quote here is pointing to. The, the stuff and the process are important, but at the end of the day, the people is what really makes anything work. So really trying to talk about this and build this up as a locus for community, for the people who are doing the work and using this stuff. That's sort of the ultimate aim of the Scholarly Communications Notebook that we're gonna be trying to, to at least figure out and get started over the next couple of years. Uh, and this conference presentation is one of the things that we're gonna be doing to make that happen. So yeah, Josh, your intuition is right on the next slide. Um, the other sort of first thing we've done is most of the grant that we got from IMLS is gonna be used um, to provide sub awards to individual contributors to ask them to look at the resources we've gathered and developed and say like, this looks pretty white or this looks pretty R1 centric or the, the models for Skullcom that you've shared so far don't reflect you know, this identity, this institution type, this type of practices, this emergent discipline or field, etc. So we want to contribute something new. So uh, I guess a little over a month ago, we, we sent out our first CFP and we invited people to uh, develop a resource that talks about Skullcom in a new way. It could be somebody who says, this is very R1-ish and I'm coming from a community college and I want to talk about how research data management fits in that context. It could be about, um, you know, this model reflects only a certain set of identities. And so I want to talk about copyright in this different way, et cetera. Um, so we released our CFP. We got a lot of really, really nice uh, proposals and we're able to fund them with, a, you can see $2,500 there, just to recognize the labor and to model that sense that we're not asking you to, to share to make our project better. We're not asking you to share out of the goodness of your heart. Um, we we want to recognize that labor as well. So we're doing the testing and relationships. Um, we're offering this funding and we're excited to have in hand and be working to develop with those creators the first set of newly created materials that we help will model um, sort of what the SCN can be. And I'll turn it over now to Maria to talk about a few examples from that practice, that process. Great, I'll start uh, just by saying a word about how this is playing out in my classroom so far. Uh, we don't have the hub or the resources yet, so I can't incorporate them into my syllabus for my scholarly communication class, which I've been teaching for, I developed at UIUC and I've been teaching for a while. And it's interesting to see it um, increase in popularity as students become more aware of the possibilities of working in this area. And uh, in the past, I've said final project, you can do a research paper, you can do a research presentation, what suits your temperament and your interests. This year, I added the option of developing an educational resource. And I told the people who chose that we'd talk of, as we went about what it means to make it open. Uh, and that uh, reflects on some aspect or tries to educate about some aspect of scholarly communication. And my students are doing cool things. Not all, some of them are scared. They said, we don't know what that means. And that's led to some good conversations about what an educational resource is exactly. Uh, but they uh, wanna opt for something more traditional, but some said, this sounds fun. I'll just, you know, one that's coming out of my students, maybe someday it'll be in our hub, uh, a choose your own adventure uh, story about cre uh, creative commons licensing. Uh, if you, which license do you apply and where might that, that lead you? or perhaps you choose not to apply the license and where might that lead you? Still in development, I won't have it to show until December, well, that's going on. Uh, we did get some wonderful responses to our call for papers and our uh, interest, our goal was really to have a lot of diversity in different ways. Uh, diversity in terms of the identity perspective of the creators, uh, diversity in terms of the institution in which the uh, resources were coming. We recognize that scholarship does, doesn't just happen at uh, big R1s where actually the three of us all, all reside at the, at the moment. It's happening at uh, community colleges and tribal colleges and uh, small liberal arts colleges. And uh, we wanted diversity in terms of the kinds of uh, submissions, the formats, the materials. 
And we did pretty well with that. Uh, we'd still like it to be more, and that will be our goal as we move forward. Uh, but we did get a, a good representation of kinds of places. And we also got a really interesting variety of what these resources will be. So just a, a few. Uh, this is a research study instrument that was developed and was used already to understand the uh, attitudes and the stakes for BIPOC faculty in using open access. So making that instrument available if students wanted to try to replicate the research or conduct it in their own way and also a lesson plan to support that. Uh, Josh, we do the next one. Uh, something a bit more playful, interesting, a, a piece of interactive fiction that will imagine a scholarly communication librarian in a somewhat distant future quotes. I noticed the word dystopian is not in here. I like that <laughs> because so how might a scholarly communication librarian be working in a few years unspecified uh, still in the 2020s, yes, but interactive fiction. Um, next one. Another playful one. Uh, I think we have a mostly North American audience, so I don't have to be concerned that people don't know what Jeopardy is, uh, but it's a quiz game. Uh, of course, we recently lost its host, much lamented, uh, but I'm not sure if how, how the hosting function will feature in this quiz game. Uh, but this one will be focused on copyright and research data management and engage students through game playing. I have a uh, game studies expert on my faculty and I showed this to her and she said, oh, oh, this is so cool. I tell you, you can gamify it, anything, uh, but she's looking forward to seeing this one. And the last one we'll feature today is uh, a more traditional lesson plan, uh, but focused on issues of cultural competency and privacy, which are both in the LIS education world, very hot topics. Uh, so that's interesting to me to see that come together with thinking about SCALCOM topics like open educational resources. Uh, so look for these soon. We hope to have them out in the world early in 2021. Uh, people have been notified of their acceptance. They're working on them right now. And uh, we'll be looking forward to incorporating them into my classroom. And I hope you'll be able to make use of them as well. Josh, you wanna start our, our place where our guests get to speak, not just us. Yeah, um, and maybe before we move into our more you know structured questions, um, I'm gonna adjust my audio real quick. Um, I, so is anybody, does anybody have questions to this point? Like is the concept of the Skullcom notebook and the like purpose of it um, is anybody lost or uh, does anybody have questions about this like sort of fundamental? Um, and we can talk about that for a minute if there are any questions. I do wanna make clear that we have, I think total it's about $75,000 to give out. I think we, we think something like 31 um, awards of $2,500. Um, that is funding to, you know, intentionally curate and populate the SCN with the kind of content that we've been talking about um, so that it's not just all our one and privileged people like us that have this kind of support to do that. But getting an award will not be necessary to contributing content to the SCN. It'll be an open platform that anyone can use and contribute to. Um, but these awards are an opportunity to think intentionally about populating it with um, the kind of content that we have in mind and also kinds of content that we haven't conceived of because of our limited ability to understand all everything, right? So is everybody comfortable at least with what the general sort of framing is? And I'll just add, if you have materials right now that would be great for the Scholarcom Notebook, reach out to us, please. Uh, we don't have the submission mechanism yet. Uh, but it will be coming soon, and we'd love to talk to you about that. 
Absolutely. And to piggyback on what Josh said, the first CFP was deliberately pretty wide open and vague because along with asking people to contribute things, we're sort of using the opportunity to think about what is the, you know, what's the shape of a thing that might go in the SCN? I mean, obviously it could be a text document or an image or a podcast or something like that, but thinking about what shape should it look like? What is the metadata around it look like, et cetera. So we're, I think we're learning a lot of really good lessons about how to bring the stuff together that's attached to the people and the process. And we've already seen some great examples. I, I wouldn't have thought to solicit a Jeopardy style game or a, a dystopian cyberpunky future kind of thing. So we've already made some discoveries. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so with uh, moving forward, feel free to um, jump in at, at any point. So um, this was the, this is a version of the question that's posted uh, with the abstract for the presentation. How can we build a community and a platform? And to our minds, those things are intrinsically connected to each other. Um, that's not only open to, but inviting for global participation. And we, you know, the people who attended today, I, I think are maybe mostly in North America. So, right, it's difficult for the three of us or the, I think 13 of us total that are on the, the meeting now to account for global participation, but we can still talk, talk about it. Um, so, and participation in the SEN is primarily two modes, right? One is using content in the SCN, either in instruction or in uh, like outside of a formal instructional context, maybe someone who wants to learn more about copyright or fair use or Creative Commons licenses or whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, so there's users and there's also contributors. Many of you on this call might well could fit into both of those camps, right? Depending on where your skill set lies and what you're interested in developing further, but also what your knowledge and experience is and what you may have to contribute. Um, and so I have some sub questions to help break this complex question up a little bit, but does anybody want to comment on um, how we go about building a community and platform that is not only open to, but inviting for global participation? And also, at the, while you're gathering your thoughts, I'll add one other thing, which is it's easy to talk about the SCN as a sort of a read-write. Either you write something and somebody else reads it, or they write something and you read it. Um, I think there's space for a lot of other in-between things. Obviously, writing reviews is something we think about a lot in terms of open educational resources. Um, but I, I think the a, an active community is forking things and mining the data in things and writing reviews about things and right there, there's a whole world of engaging with being inspired by critiquing etc that can happen that that is somewhere in between i wrote a thing somebody should read it and somebody wrote a thing i'm gonna read it anyone have anything to say at the high level um and if not i can jump into the sub questions, which might be a good vehicle for um, kind of breaking apart this really admittedly broad question. Um, I have a question for you guys. Um, something that I've always thought of this, and when I hear scholarly communication, I always think of a higher education context. But then when I think about Creative Commons or fair use, like K to 12 does come to mind. And I was wondering how you envision that. And if you think of it as open to like school librarians as well, or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, we are based in higher education and our primary audience, you know, we're kind of pointing at is library and information studies, faculty and, uh, and graduate students, but we definitely embrace and recognize that these topics are not exclusive to that audience within higher ed, that that audience doesn't exclusively operate in higher ed and that, right, like copyright is, what I tell people when I talk about it is it's universal, it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere, right? It infuses so many aspects of daily mundane modern life. Um, and yeah, Creative Commons licenses, um, there's over one, 0.6 billion things that have been uh, licensed with the CC license. Obviously, all of that is not appropriate for, so, you know, like the vast majority of it is much broader than, than higher ed. 
um, not to open educational resources that shows up in this conference. There are K-12 sessions. Um, there's a role for kind of like non-educational settings and people learning um, and continuing their sort of like professional or personal growth. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we, I don't, we have to think about whether or not we can be all things to all people. Um, I mean, obviously I think we can't, but the platform will not have a login, right, for uh, users. And so the the intent is to be able to utilize content in whatever uh, place, setting, mode, whether we had conceived of it from the get-go or not. But we do want to think broadly about that. I'll just add that uh, open education was a later addition to my syllabus in scholarly communication. The first time I taught it, which was, uh, think back, 2014, uh, the uh, open education uh, conversation wasn't quite as robust. It was there, but not as robust as it, as it is these days. And then after a couple of years, I thought, hmm, I saw uh, open education work often aligning with scholarly communication work in the field and thought the students should be aware of that. But what I've begun to say to my students is that the classroom is really the primary site of scholarly communication. It's the very first place in which scholarship is communicated to young developing scholars. And that could be kindergartners. That it's all, and maybe the beauty of having these open objects that can be remixed, remade, is that uh, educators can tailor them to that audience. Uh, one of my students now is starting to think toward public libraries, not academic libraries, but she's very engaged with the issues. And the day we were talking about publishing and things like OJS, she said, so this could be used like for a community journal, right? We could figure out how to, I don't know, voice uh, the history of the community in a, in a journal that was made by the public library. So, sure, you could do that. But, but you could imagine that kind of thing moved into a, a high school classroom as well. So I think there are opportunities there. Great. And Danielle, I see your, your comment in the chat. Um, and I think you, you're, you're right. I mean, there's, um, you know, like the Babson survey, if you're familiar with that, we know that one of the barriers to greater use of OER is a lack of faculty awareness of where to find it. And so that, like the Open Education Network and the Open Textbook Library, is something that we're trying to solve is at least within SCALCOM topics to be able to say, here's a, a site, our, you know, our project site, um, an openly licensed book from a publisher that you understand and value, ACRL, um, the Association of College and Research Libraries in the US, and uh, a corpus of content that relates to it that's more modular uh, and um, community driven. Um, but we do have, you know, so that they have a place to look, but you're right in that we're not, I don't think, too focused on the things have to be there. And in fact, there's lots of things that already exist, of course, that would be really appropriate for having in the SCN um, or linking to from the SCN and sort of creating, recognizing that whether we did the SCN or not, there's a like network of this kind of stuff. And we're trying to provide sort of a landing page where people who are less familiar with it and those sources can find it as a starting point to help facilitate that growth and use um, and teaching of the skills and knowledge. Um, but one of the things that we want to do with our funded projects that we're accepting to the SCN is create blog posts, uh, you know, have blog posts for each project and then, you know, distribute those on social media and other places as it makes sense. And so like thinking, you know, broadly about that, but you, you make a really good point about not being too myopically focused on like a single platform. Um, so this is I a do think, Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, sorry, I was, I was going to say, I, I think it's, I think it's a point well made, especially the, the sort of the tech, you use the term tech phobic, and that's probably overstating it, at least for myself, who's just sort of tech uncertain sometimes, but um, we initially explored some platforms that were much higher barrier to entry, like GitHub, and we rejected those for some of the reasons I think I hear 
in your comment, which is that that can feel daunting. I think OER Commons is the is the sort of easiest to pick up and use. It basically just feels like a web page. But I do think there's value in having some sort of center of gravity that the community can sort of orbit around in different ways. And I think there's value in gathering some of the artifacts in a way that you can point to it and say, I did that, right? That's the open pedagogy contribute to the commons thing. Um, and if you want, you can put an alt metrics donut on that and say like, oh, this has been really impactful. If I'm a scholar, I can show that to my promotion and tenure faculty. If I'm going home for the holidays, I can show it to my family and say, whoa, 100,000 people downloaded this thing I made. I, I think um, not as a barrier, not as the only way to do it, but I do think that there's some value to that center of gravity. It, interactive events is definitely something that we're we're thinking about um, and pointing to different audiences, like how do we engage directly with LIS students, independent of their faculty? How do we engage directly with uh, LIS faculty and, and so on um, and creating opportunities to, to engage? Um, so here's what I think, you know, like something being useful to any audience is that it has to address needs, right? And so um, to the extent well, you know, we have ideas about what the Skullcom topics are that are most pressing uh, or most in need of teaching and learning content, but we are all based at R1s in the United States. And so um, we wondered if this group has ideas about, you know, what are the most, the, the Skullcom topics that you see in, in most need of teaching and learning content? And these might be niche too, like open education is a big topic, but like what are like accessibility in open education is a smaller topic. And even within that, you can get into more, you know, pieces obviously. But we, we wonder as we're thinking about gaps to address, what, what you think those gaps are. And one way into that question with, with an OER sort of framing is what, when you started your job, did you not know that you wish somebody had told you? What, if you had had a, a coworker who could have taken you aside and said, hey, you need to know that, you know, the open textbook library has these ratings and faculty sometimes find that really powerful. Like what's what's the stuff that, that you wish you had known that you didn't know when you started your, doing your work? Peer review for open textbooks, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think also to build on that, Stacy, peer review. Uh, like, as a new librarian, the first time uh, I was asked to do a peer review, um, I went to one of my mentors and said, "Do you have any?" input about how I go about this because I had never had any like training in it. Um, and they actually said they had never done one, which sort of blew my mind. And so then I had to like kind of figure it out. Uh, and there was, you know, the journal editor and other um, kind of guidelines and stuff to, to do that. Um, but I think resources in how to do peer, a, a journal peer review but higher ed context that's something that if i mean if you're in a research role you're likely to be asked to do certainly as an author of research articles i think it's kind of my responsibility to do about two reviews for every paper that i have published or submit that undergoes review I've been in this game a couple of decades now. So I'm thinking back to when I started working in it. And, uh, but all along the way, and I'm seeing a little bit of this here, might be, um, it would have been good to know more. I try to talk about this with my students some now, uh, about points of resistance uh, to participating in, we could say open education or what we call in the title of our book, open culture. Uh, on the part of, on the part of scholars, because 
you know, I'm sort of a good hearted commie. And I was like, oh, of course, everybody wants to do this. Sharing your work, making the world a better place. Uh, but not all facts that way. And we have some um, pretty well articulated reasons why not. Uh, but it's, ta it's taken me a while and I'm still discovering it with my colleagues now to understand like, why not do this? Uh, that would be good to know more about. Um, Danielle, can, would you be willing to say more about um, your comment, the gap in knowledge about student performance and learning experience when using innovative approaches? Do you mean like assessing open pedagogic practices, for example? Um, hi, I, I've done my PhD on, on open educational practices. Um, and so where I'm coming from is that the literature generally in open education seems to be about students' perceptions. Um, and there's very little that measures student performance. Uh, there's, you know, it, it would also be nice to, to see about different ways to improve the learning experience, um, how to make it more effective and going beyond students' perceptions because just because you perceive uh, your learning to be better doesn't mean it actually is. Um, there's the author, I think it's Julie Durkin or Dirksen, who is an instructional designer and she explained just because something is your preference, just, be, you know, people have that thing, oh, I'm a visual learner. Oh, I'm an auditory learner. Uh, are you really? Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm saying is that based on what I've seen, uh, there's not enough to measure student performance using different techniques. Uh, and I'm against open just for the sake of open. So I, I, for me, it's open for a purpose is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when I have, talked to um, about the research on open at my own institution, um, like at the Center for Teaching Excellence, for example, the head of that is a psychologist and they immediately go to like, well, perceptions, you know, um, <laughs> and sort of they are unconvinced by, by that. Okay, um, we can, so, um, I need to close the chat and participants, which I've been monitoring. So, you know, when we think about users, what is it, what, what criteria are important? What, in, you know, invites or acknowledges participation? What is sufficient um, or if not, you know, sufficient, the original question that this is breaking down, right, is uh, a community and platform that is open to and inviting for broad participation. Um, and so when we think about users and the next one is contributors, um, what what should we be thinking about in setting the, in, in framing and design and um, mar marketing and our approaches? Yeah, relevance and ease of use. So we talked some earlier about technical barriers and how that would sort of be the opposite of ease of use. Are, are there other things that would m make something feel easy to use? Like what? what's an example of something that's easy to use or, or maybe what's the opposite? What's something that you go, I'd love to use that, but it's just not worth the trouble. Jess, when you say platform agnostic, you mean like not developing in a software that requires the use of that software, um, like using open tools and that sort of thing? Yeah, great. Yeah, and Danielle, you talk oh, about easy ahead. to adapt into current teaching approaches. That's something we've been really puzzling over in our heads is what's the, we keep using uh, great words like pedagogical apparatus, but like what's the, what's the stuff that goes along with an interesting resource that makes it really easy to plug into a classroom and use right away. And I think we've, we've got some ideas about that, but any, any, anybody who wants to share, here's how you transform something from an object to a learning object. 
that's something I don't know much about and I'm, I've been excited to learn more about. And Stacey, I'll like say as an instructor, oh. that's, that's tricky because, you know, I'm, I'm trying to uh, walk the talk all the time. And when it comes to when I need something for a class, I'm like, okay, how do I use this exactly? Uh, a, a quick example, uh, I included for the first time in my class this year, a, a unit on um, researcher identity. I, I talked about it as communicating scholarly identity as part of scholars, scholarly communication. It's like, well, crap, I haven't taught this before. What am I gonna do? So I reached out to my friends, Josh and Will, um, who I know do a lot of workshops and uh, educational uh, work. And, and, and I said, have you all done stuff? In this? And well, they had wonderful slide sets, both of them, which happened to be CC licensed. Uh, I got them from my friends, but of course they were also a kind of open ed educational resource. And then I sat there with the two of them going, okay, how do I make these mine? Uh, how do I fit them into the class? Worked really well. I was an amalgamation. I had to dink around with the themes of two different slide sets to make it all look nice. But uh, then I still had to impose some um, apparatus and, and comments around them to make it work in the classroom. Uh, so it worked well, but it's something we're asking a faculty to, even though we're meeting a need that they have, uh, that they have to do the work to make it work in their classroom. Mm -hmm. Stacy, I love your idea about like a pathway, um, like taking a concept and providing like an like someone with content expertise, a path that uses resources that scaffolded um, is really interesting. So um, move, the same question, but again, I need to be able to see the slides, but for contributors. So if we're thinking about like what would be attractive to you to share your content and it might be that uh funding is the answer right like that's why we have the the imls funding to distribute over the next there were two more rounds over the next 18 to 24 months um but what if there's not funding well you know there's limited funding we can give out about 31 of those awards so like what why would you contribute content to the SCN, what can we do to make that open to contribution and inviting to contribution? It's a great point, Stacey, the self efficacy piece. And that's we we did a bunch of these workshops that are that were just about micro creation of OER, where it was like, think about something not academic, right? I know how to juggle, so make a little quick OER and how to teach somebody how to juggle. So I, I I think one of the things that we think about is like, if it's something you know how to do, share it, and maybe it's useful to a million people, and maybe it's useful to just one person who wants to learn how to juggle or whatever, but like sharing information is is a positive good in and of itself, as long as the barriers aren't too high and the costs are pretty limited. But that's a, that's a really good point. Like who cares about my stuff is a question we all ask a lot, I'm sure. Yeah, being new to the Midwest, to the American Midwest, it, there's this like Midwest um, humility thing that is very, very real here where people do not brag on themselves. Um, they, you know, like just would, don't do it. I love this idea, idea too of quick and clear feedback on that thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I could imagine us saying like a uh, quick thanks. This is awesome. We appreciate it. I could imagine uh, supporting uh, folks who offer a more formal review process, right? This could be like a journal and that there's actually some peer review. This could also be like the OTL in that users just offer feedback when they're considering it or when they're using it. Um, when you say feedback, is it, I imagine it's some of both, but which looms larger? Thanks for your contribution. We see and value your labor. Um, I'm also an expert and these are the strengths and weaknesses of this thing or something else. Danielle, we, um... Your comment in the chat, we, we struggled um, with, in our first call for proposals, 
Well, we've struggled. we've been talking about like open learning objects and then sort of going like interrogating that. What what is what does that mean? And like what you know, we can of course we you know, we have ideas, but we didn't want to limit people might have better ideas or broader ideas or uh, more expansive ideas, just like things that we didn't conceive of. And so we wanted to be intentionally open and flexible, but I think over time we'll get a better grasp on that and we'll be able to provide uh, guidance in that direction while I hope maintaining that maybe somebody has a really awesome idea for something that we aren't creative enough to consider and you know that being also welcome yeah we've talked about having one of the nice things about the hubs is you can have like little sub areas in there and so saying like this is a copyright topic and so i could imagine i'm, I'm a copyright nerd so just going to a resource like this once a month and saying like oh what new copyright stuff has popped up so the labeling it in that way whether that's metadata or folders or whatever um that's useful. On the other hand, we don't want the copyright and research data to not go in research data, et cetera. So, so identifying in a way that makes it clear, but not sort of limiting or imposing. So maybe we've mined this. So I think Maria, this is a question to host. Yeah, in, in some ways we've already asked the question I was gonna to use to guide this a bit. Hey, many of you probably consider yourself scholars. You certainly support scholars in the course of your work. And we're wondering what you see as the diversity of needs. Uh, but Josh also asked, like, what, what do people need? Uh, but I'm thinking particularly in the global context, uh, how might uh, global needs differ? And I, three things came to mind as we were talking earlier. Uh, one is, uh, I'm sure we'll would have something to say about this. Uh, copyright law is different in different countries and on different continents and uh, uh, copyright practices, uh, how the culture feel, feels about them and how can we reflect that. I was also put in mind of, I'm on the publications committee for ACES, the Society for Information Science and Technology. And I've been trying to make some trouble and say, hey, maybe our journal should be open access. You know, we're all about access. Uh, there's a problem that JSIS, the premier journal, actually brings in quite a bit of money for the society, so they're reluctant on that. But um, one of the other members of the uh, committee is a woman on a faculty in Nigeria, and she chatted me privately in our last meeting. She said, you don't understand. There's no way I could pay, I could pay um, publication fees. No way I can come up with that kind of money. That's just such a barrier to entry for me and it would be for a lot of people in the developing world of course there's other models for for financing uh, open access but you know that's something we may not be sensitive to uh in our relatively wealthy position uh those were uh, a couple that i that i thought of uh what are some other um how do, how do we address the diversity of, of global needs are there are they different topics um, if it's outside of North America. I didn't, I'm trying to think, do we have any Canadians uh, um, we did on the chat right now? Um, you know, maybe there's just difference between the US and Canada. So are there some uh, venues, fora we can be in to listen, to understand what the diversity of needs is. Uh, a Canadian, yay. Oh, language, that's interesting. But uh, just on Tuesday, one of my students did a, um, a presentation on language uh, as a barrier to, to scholarship. Uh, she's, her research indicated that 80% of scientific publishing is in English, uh, and so you know, what does that what does that mean for people uh, who aren't fluent or who may not be as comfortable in, in that language? Even in a really, I think, maybe minor way, a lot of the contributors to our book are in, I, either Canadian or based in Canada, uh, and so are the 
different spellings like theater and color and um, the, those, you know, minor, same language, a little bit different um, spellings. And so I, we haven't tackled this yet. Yeah, as, um, as editors, but we'll either have to align it all in the American uh, spelling or align it all in the Canadian spelling or let the book have both and not fret over it. Um, and uh, I, you know, what, I don't know if ACRL has an opinion about that, um, but uh, just another like thing to wrestle uh, in a net big editorial project. Yeah, that bibliodiversity topic is something we've been kicking around a little bit internally, and it's something we've seen a lot in the Skullcom literature. So I think this is another place where the, the Skullcom questions and the OER questions align in really important ways. Maria had to deck out for her other uh, mandated meeting, but Will, do you want to take over the, the, the last question? Uh, sure, yeah. So the, the last question is about um, we talk about it as practices, policies, and supports, but it, it really gets to that, um, the idea we talked about earlier of building this, this sort of framework for openness in a different way, particularly as we move into the global context. Um, so maybe the next question, the, the sort of sub-question I've got on the next slide is a nice way into that. Um, we're all, not just North America, but U.S. and in particular, what are the dumb assumptions where we might be making? What are the things that, that we are, aren't even thinking about like labor, labor um, or that sort of thing that we should be aware of as we try to make this more of a global resource? Um, so to the extent that you have that perspective, sharing it would be awesome or to the extent that you've done that work. Yeah, so Jess, money for sure. Yep, that's a big one, absolutely. Um, and so far our funding, because it's come from a US agency it's been a lot easier to pay somebody in the U.S. So as we start thinking about connecting to global audiences, um, yeah, thinking about ways we can do that. As you all have done work in open education, right, we, we talk about these as global resources in a sense, right, that this open textbook can be used by anybody in the world. Um, and often we then talk about sort of localizing it in different ways. But, but I'm, I'm curious if that's something you all have wrestled with as well. And I see a comment in the chat here about fit. Yeah, yeah, very America centric. Can you say more about that? Do you, do you mean we need to make it so it's comfortable for different interested folks or? Hi, yeah, it's Cindy. And yes, I think so. I think a lot of times, um, it's like when you're doing work with in inclusivity, um, you have to make sure that you're being very um, cognizant of other people. Um, I know language was mentioned, but um, that they feel this is also directed toward them. It's not just directed toward one group of people. I, I'm on a number of listservs from the UK, and I do find, I mean, obviously a lot of their you know, announcements and such relate specifically to their country. But I feel that everything they put out and discuss, I do also, you know, so I feel included in the conversation. And um, I just think that's something you have to keep in mind, probably because I'm doing, I'm on a committee right now with inclusivity, but I think that's something that's easy to forget. For sure. That's, I think, the, the number one thing that keeps me up at night with this project is the sort of nothing about us without us aspect of that and the right. And that's where open ed is right now. It's not enough to say, here's a thing with an open license. Problem solved. Everything is OK now, right? Um, right. It's, it's building in the, the social supports and the structural supports and everything. So yeah, I, I, I don't expect you have a magic wand either. If you do, <laughs> please wave it. But um, that's, that's our, our work and everybody's work, I think, for the foreseeable future in this space. Yeah, I mean, and we know that there's a ton of assumptions in, in the open education community that everything we create is magically accessible or that everyone has the bandwidth or that um, 
everyone has the technical capability of um, modifying content. Like we say it's modifiable and that's legally true, but is it technically true? Um, Jess, if you're still here, I think about and refer to your keynote from the Open Education Conference two years ago really regularly on this is like what, how the struggle of doing as much as we can and yet recognizing that it's not enough or, and maybe it's not as much as we can um, that like what is our level of tolerance for um, the, the gaps and particularly the, the people who fall through those gaps. Thank you for that, by the way. Like, it still really resonates, uh, and I, I think about it a good bit. Oh, thanks, Josh. Um, that's amazing to hear. It, it, it's it, an unfair ask in some ways um, to always um, prod people with that, but it seems that every once in a while we need to be shaken out of our assumptions. Mm -hmm. One of the assumptions that I start to think about when I start to think about um, scholarly communications is who gets to publish and what does it look like to publish does it have to be a book um, what in other words what are the forms that we're recreating and is it necessary that we recreate those or can we imagine it happening in a very different way and what would that look like and you know what are the platforms that support that what are the platforms that stand in the way of that yeah, like in a, in if I think about our book, um, we even within our collaboration. So like, Will is not in a tenure track role, and in like in a and in a lot of ways is like, pff, who cares about that? I think, and is that fair, Will? Um, yeah, yeah, I, I have the privilege of not having to worry about that. <laughs> right, and I am, and like my tenure file is being considered by my institution right now, um, and so like. We even within our collaborative, Maria is also, um, though in a more senior position, um, you know, we, within our work, we I have to think about how to fit it in boxes that are recognized as having value, right? And then when we're thinking about the, if we want the stuff to be adopted and utilized in LIS programs, then we need to appeal to LIS faculty who frequently think of themselves more like English faculty or any other disciplinary department than they do like librarians. And so like they're presenting them with something that they recognize and don't just like reject out of hand was something that we were thinking about. But we also want, you know, with that product done to think like, well, what is like the, you know, what, what are the other um, possibilities? And like one of them that I th I'm almost certain will develop is uh, like a, a press books um, mounted version of it with lots of multimedia and um, additional content because we won't be limited by a book format, you know, and that's still booky, right? But like, I think you're, you make an excellent point where like we are both <laughs> reifying like book to appeal as well as to work within our the own reward structures that we're subject to um and trying to challenge and complicate that as well it's a it's a weird sometimes uncomfortable place to be but like that's a rich place to be as well there's a ton of potential there and i think that's the work of skullcom to a certain extent i'm sorry please go ahead I was just going to say, sorry, Will, it's, it's interesting. Um, a couple of things. You, Will, you, you and I have the privilege of not being encumbered by this because we're not tender track. And that there is a privilege in that. I also was at a session, I think it opened in last week. It's all blurring together now, but um, mm -hmm. where somebody was talking about the act of being professionalized. And, um, you know, she was talking about it from the perspective of a tender track um, junior faculty member. And it kind of struck me, it's really interesting because at the same time, I want to understand when somebody becomes professionalized, I want to understand when they become radicalized. So 
in their teaching, do they refuse to use cis white men? I mean, I heard that from a lot of people at Open Ed last week, and you know, that's one choice. Um, you know, do you refuse to use resources that aren't open? Do you, where are you drawing a line and standing up and saying, this is my act of resistance. I can't change the academy. I can't change hundreds of years of expectations. And maybe I could have a little bit of a pinch on the tenure track committee and uh, encourage them to sort of see that the world is more complex. But um, it, it makes me, uh, it's the contrarian in me, I think, that whenever there's a form, I want to ask about the anti-form. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Thanks for sharing. Um, the, the humility that I try to bring to it is for a lot of faculty, right? Well, some faculty like a textbook because that's the thing they know and textbooks are good and proper. But for a lot of faculty, asking them to move away from a textbook is asking a lot of labor from them. And so I, I think the work of Skalcom in general is saying like, this is an old calcified, inequitable crappy system but there's some stuff that if we threw that out too that would that would put a lot of labor on a lot of people particularly adjuncts and folks who you know who are already under a lot of stress so so the, the value of a book is if you need the structure of a book here you go it's scaffolded really well it, it builds on itself really well and we're going to try to transform the pieces of it that aren't great by not having just a single correct author or whatever but but Josh, to your point, I, I think there's a there's a we use the textbook because it's valued in certain ways, but there's also value in the structure of a textbook. And I think I, I always try to write. I, I get to be on the ramparts going like, throw it, burn it all down, change everything. But then I have to go to a faculty member who's like, no, I'm I need those ancillary materials because I'm I'm teaching five courses at three different institutions. Asking me to change everything is just asking a lot on my behalf from your position of not having to do the work. So I, I think our job is to say, um, throw out the crappy stuff, find the good stuff and try to build on that and keep that as well. And that's that's hard work, but I think it's really necessary work, whether you're, whether it's copyright or data management or open education or whatever. Well, and that, I mean, you know, to think more broadly than open ed or, or like teaching folk goal points, the um, scholarly communication more broadly, there's lots of that as well, right? Like. Not only should you publish, which is the main thing that you're rewarded for, uh, that your career depends on, but you know you should be critical of your publication contracts. You should read them carefully, understand them, uh, and archive them and name them in a format that <laughs> makes sense in six years. Um, you should put your accepted manuscript somewhere that people more broadly than uh, subscribing institutions have access to them um, when it comes to data. Uh, you know, that's the principle, I think. I don't work a lot on research data management, um, but when I had conversations with scholars, they're like, wait, now I have to like have a data management plan and execute that plan. <laughs> like, and they think about the risk, both the unrewarded nature of that in the formal reward structure, as well as the real or imagined risk that they're taking in, in the vulnerability of that, you know, of making their data available. I had one, uh, a social scientist say like, yeah, but career, scholar, scholarship is adversarial and careers are made and broken um, by establishing or undermining a, a, a point. Uh, and and I was like, yeah, but like, if you objectively, don't you see that that is better science <laughs> uh, and uh, that's good? And he said, sure, but I want tenure <laughs> and like, I want a paycheck. And like, I, it's hard to be really critical of that in that, that conversation. I mean, it's complicated. Really good discussion. Maybe we go to the next question, which I think is the last question that we have. And I'm getting some echo here, so I apologize for that. Um, but this is this is in some in some sense the big question that we're wrestling with, which is if if our if our job is to genuinely invite and make possible participation from people we have done a bad job at connecting with in the past, 
how do we do that in a way that's meaningful and real and genuine as opposed to just sort of performative or like we we did what we said we were supposed to do so we we want our cookie now right and it's it's framed here in terms of a global audience but we could say the same thing about community colleges or tribal colleges or, or anybody who has been excluded traditionally from this work how do you genuinely open a door and and pave the road or do whatever metaphor you want for for making that participation possible right so far we focused on the idea of funding contributions with the idea that that recognizes labor that that gives you some models to say like this is for you too community college folks here are 10 awesome community college people doing that work um is is that the trick is is it about doing outreach in specific fields communities nations um is it about saying like maybe the the problem is your three you know r one e white you know whatever people you need ongoing guidance that's recognized and rewarded from people who are in you know if, if you want a global audience maybe don't all be from the u.s if you want to you know whatever audience etc so so and again if you have a magic wand for this you can you can wave your magic wand and you can retire to your own private island but um <laughs> i i any any tips you can have on how to address this one i think will make the work so much stronger i i think it's really important to find them if need be and invite them because nothing is worse than coming to something whatever it is and it's the same old people mm -hmm. you know the five to ten people that you hear about on every listserv or you know you know obviously they've achieved well and and their voice is definitely heard but for all of those voices there are probably hundreds or thousands of voices that aren't heard and i think um that's the real way to reach out because you can post things on listservs and that's a good thing to do i mean that's one way but I think you have to just be more intrusive than that, or you won't get the diversity that you want. Um, and that's both, you know, stateside, Canada, and also international. You know, they exist out there, but they're hidden gems. And um, I think that's just really important. Thank you, Cindy. Maybe we are at final thoughts. Yeah, I was gonna say maybe that was a Freudian click forward. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know if we established who would kind of take and run with um, final final thoughts, but um, I this has been you know like the these que the questions are 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 big ones and like to me feel amorphous and like we're talking about like a global like research the research enterprise scholarship uh, these concepts are global in nature and yet local you know, in many of their applications and practices and we're trying to think expansively about all of our work but especially the you know we don't want to just replicate um, Matt Ruin who's at Grand Valley State University uh, in Michigan. We hosted an event a couple years ago uh, with our first IMLS grant funding. We got about forty people together in in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, at NC State, and um, talked for a day and a half about uh, what is scholarly communication, how do we do it, like what what should be in the book. And um, there was some noise on Twitter, of course, and Matt made a really excellent point that like there's this interesting event going on and I'm seeing good things come out of it, um, but they're, they're, they're all R1 people and they mostly were. Uh, and um, we, we want to 
you know, we are R1 people uh, and that's a privilege, you know, and there are costs and benefits associated with that. And we want to be critical and thoughtful in not just providing resources that are useful in our own context because research and teaching isn't only happening in our own context. In fact, frequently it's being done far more effectively, but uh, not in our contexts. Um, so this has been useful for us in kind of checking some of our assumptions and um, brainstorming and we really do appreciate your time. Um, we do try to maintain our website that LIS, um, do we have it on the next slide? No, um, it's back here. Um, and I can't see it because of <laughs> lis.wordpress.ncsu.edu. And we're, we're, we're really available, um, so we, um, this is where we push our CFPs. We also push them to Twitter. Um, we invite comments and um, staying in touch uh, and feedback, including critical feedback, um, and uh, really appreciate everyone spending your time. Um, there's a lot of great sessions going on right now, and so um, we appreciate you coming to this one and hope that you got something useful out of it. Uh, we have. And Will, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think you said it really well. We like so in terms of next steps, we're gonna we're gonna keep uh, pushing the calls. The first one was the the sort of sub version of it was help us figure out what a CFP should look like. Help us figure out what we're gonna look like. The next two I think are gonna have a a new sort of area of focus. Uh, so it might be right, but right. Our work is, is going to continue to be filling in gaps. So it might be, we've noticed that it's all R1. So now we're going to focus specifically on non R1 folks. It might be, it's all academics. So we need mostly professionals and people who aren't in the academy, um, but helping us think through the gaps in particular, right? This is, you, you, you had been covering 0%. Now you're covering 20%. Okay. Let's talk about 30, 40 and on from there. So the, I think we're, we're doing the best we know how to do, but the more people point out areas that we can improve or gaps, the, the better a job we can do and the better the project will be overall. So thank you for helping us do a little of that work here. I, I hope it was useful. Yeah, we, we, we definitely want to live in beta, right? Like this is never done work. This is just like it um, iterating towards better, I guess. Thank you so much. I wonder if we want to stop the recording and can still Seven. hang out for a while. Yeah, we're, I mean, I'm, this session goes for another 40 minutes technically, and I'm happy to hang out for that time. But if people sure. want to do other things, they're, they're certainly welcome. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, can I stop the recording? Nope. I